Welcome again, everyone, if you're just joining uh, to the How Good Innovation Online series. We're focusing on biodiversity, regenerative agriculture, and planetary health. I'm going to uh, give a bit of a talk on measuring biodiversity, but then we'll also have some uh, interactive discussions with um, myself, Ethan Silva, Chief Innovation Officer here, and Arthur Gillette, the Director of Research. So before I sort of uh, dive in and start uh, going through just a handful of slides here, um, I thought I would just introduce Arthur and say, um, yeah, this is working on biodiversity in this company is not new. Arthur, it's something you've been doing for quite some time. And I wonder if you might just speak for a minute to the, some of the origins of uh, thinking about and measuring biodiversity at How Good, uh, which has sort of started us on the path to where we are today. Yeah, um, I'd love to. Uh, we, we started, I guess, it's been a really interesting path for us. We, we've, it, it's been kind of a, a path toward complexity and subtlety. We, we started off with a, a very brutal measurement. Um, one of our early academic advisors um, were always kind of playing this role between activists, academics, and um, brands. And one of our early academic advisors um, was uh, a professor at Duke and, and very, very aggressively working to protect um, rainforest in Indonesia and Malaysia. And, and he had this incredibly compelling argument for how much of it is in the American food system, how much of it is in our food stream, and you're working with American consumers, so measure that. And then is it knocking down virgin forest? Nothing else counts. Nothing else counts. Nothing else counts. And that was the measurement. That was the, the it was so, it, he, he was so clear and he was making this very clear argument for, um, for why, you know, something like palm would be a major, major, major problem in 2007, 2008, um, before it, it quite kind of become part of the zeitgeist. But, um, and, but it got really interesting when that started being a reason not to worry too much about um, some crops from Brazil because they weren't making it into the American food streams. And that's what we were, that's, those were the consumers and brands we were working with. And at which, you know, was started to shift, started to shift where we were emphasizing supporting changes because they were changes that we could actually help make. Um, and so that was our kind of starting point. Um, and it was very harsh grading system of, of effectively. And we've moved from there over time. Um, I think while still holding on to the importance of that underlying message, that loss of habitat, destruction of habitat, basically multiplied by the density of species in that habitat is incredibly important. So while holding on to that, we've just started to move through what that means, not just for say uh, animals and above ground biomass, but for soil, for um, microbial diversity, for fungal diversity, for soil structure diversity, we've started pushing into understanding the terrain and the need for the diversity of terrain, for diversity of practices, diversity of, you know, the, the kind of standard um, branded biodiversity of just having like a different species of monoculture plant in their product. Um, and measuring all of those things and starting to see how they, how they interact and how they can co-evolve or how they might impede the evolution of understanding um, in a given product or set of products. So it's been a fun path and um, it's been a really interesting movement away from effectively what was a well-informed but still activist outlook towards a, a very well-balanced um, scientific understanding that still has that leaning towards where is the biggest impact and how do we make sure we never lose track of that. Yeah, and it's really helped recently in the last uh, nine months, we've developed a partnership with Bioversity International, uh, which is part of the global CGIAR. Um, and they have an unbelievable amount of data and insight and scientists who are working on understanding biodiversity 
at a global scale. And so we're now integrating that data into our data sets and into the formulation impact tool that we've built um, to get finer and finer grain detail over time. And so I think that's a great yeah, path that we've been on from uh, clear, useful, efficient, not very complex to more and more complex while still maintaining that focus on, on what really matters. That said, what really matters changes depending on who you are, what your company is, uh, what you're interested in measuring, what you're interested in promoting. And so part of our work today uh, will be to look at a few different levels, not just levels of biodiversity, which you may have seen if you've uh, checked out some of our other talks, but levels of measuring biodiversity uh, and how different companies, especially in the products industry, are going about doing that. So here we go. Um, how good, as most of you know, but some of you don't, we've been around for 13 years doing global supply chain mapping and research. There's 386 data sources and certifications that we pulled from, for example. One, one of them is the whole agrobiodiversity index that we just talked about. So that's one of the 386 that we're pulling from and structuring into our database to map out 33,000 different ingredients, chemicals, and materials, including soon packaging. Uh, there's a packaging version of our tool on the way. Um, we take 127 different sustainability attributes and apply them to assess over a million different consumer goods uh, at the UPC level. We have some large partnerships with some uh, of the bigger retailers that are out there, Ajo Belhez especially, and work with some of the larger CPGs in the space, Danone, General Mills, Applegate, uh, as well as um, the syndicated sales data providers, Nielsen and Spins. I put Bioversity International there because it's just an important one that's been helping our thinking along for this. So a definition of biodiversity that we use and have expanded on um, and if anybody wants a, a paper where this is kind of clarified and written out, just shoot me an email afterwards, uh, Ethan and Howgood, and I can send you a link to that paper. Um, one definition that we use is variation of life at all levels of biological organization. And so we've outlined these eight different levels at which biodiversity becomes important. Uh, Arthur was just sort of speaking to going right to the top to say, especially at a global scale, if you're thinking about is there forest loss, for example, for palm oil or for soy or for cattle, for whatever it is, at the sort of eco-region and land use scale. It was just one brutal measurement. Is it cutting down rainforest? Yes or no. Uh, but it's also useful to think about and understand what is the agricultural biodiversity? What are the different ingredients and crops that are being used? Maybe what are even the heritage varieties? Somebody told me yesterday they, were, uh, they got a face mask, a special COVID face mask that was knitted from heritage green and orange cotton grown on a particular small farm uh, in California, a woman, indigenous seed keeper, who's been keeping these ancient strains of cotton alive that has, have beautiful colors. And he's got a cool face mask of it. So that's like an agricultural uh, biodiversity in terms of specific crops, or, or even within that, the genetic diversity uh, of different varieties of cotton or apples or kiwi fruit or uh, cows. So this is the overall image that we use and the sort of eight levels of biodiversity that we talk about and think about. Our focus today though is gonna be a little different. Our focus today is gonna be on measuring biodiversity and what's out there currently, what are people doing, what are they not doing, what might they be doing, what are some potential new directions that are emerging. And so I'm gonna lay out a three level framework uh, that is being, people are, they're not necessarily using this, but they're measuring based on some of these different levels and kind of throw in some example claims that you might see connected to each. So the first one, uh, this is the business as usual level, which is basically not measuring. Um, there's no measurement of biodiversity. There's no reference to it. Uh, if somebody was launching a new product, um, they might make a claim like, hey, we have a cool new ingredient. It's got 92 nutrients in it. It might even be a biodiverse ingredient, but it's not even mentioning it, it's just saying, hey, there's something about this that's interesting and cool. And this is most of uh, the industry right now is not really aware of or focusing on the value or impacts of biodiversity. Then the next level up is the product level of biodiversity. So here's where somebody is focusing on the ingredients or characteristics of one sort of individual product. 
So like it's saying in this product, we have a new biodiverse ingredient, like Moringa is in this product or Fonio. Actually, I just saw Yolele, uh, who we're going to talk with in a couple of weeks, just uh, put out a product that's a Fonio peel off that has Moringa in it. So that's doubling up on sort of agricultural biodiversity. But this is really just looking at the product itself and what's in it and not necessarily the larger impacts or effects of that product. So the third level uh, is the systems level. And at the systems level, you're not just saying what's in the product or what are the sort of benefits of that, but you're saying what are the systemic impacts on biodiversity of all those eight levels of biodiversity from not just the product, but all the life phases of the product. So is, you know, this could even go to the level of looking at packaging and saying, is this a, a plastic packaging that's going to end up in the ocean and be contributing, you know, microplastics to the damaging of aquatic life. Uh, it could also go back to the extraction of the, I don't know, sodium bicarbonate or um, potassium sorbate or, uh, you know, something you wouldn't ever usually think of as like a biodiverse thing, but what is the impact of the mining of that or the creation of each of those ingredients on the ecosystems where it's coming from? And so at the systems level, you might see a claim, I haven't seen many like this, I'd love to see more, um, <clears throat> something like, oh, we are sourcing our breadfruit from agroforestry systems that not only have economic and nutritional benefits, but uh, it's helping farmers and has led to 6,000 acres being reforested. So there's a sort of consumer facing claim that talks about a systems level impact. Let me just pause there and see, does that make sense? Are there any sort of thoughts or questions uh, that emerge from that? Or Arthur, do you have anything you want to add or sort of ask me about in there? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing that comes up over and over again, whenever we get into this, I feel like is, is, <clears throat> um, what is that difference between an ingredient level and a system level? And the, the system level claim, I, I find one of the exciting things is when you, get into, when you get into systems impact, you start seeing that the impact on, say, soil is linked to the impact on uh, microbial biodiversity, obviously, but uh, then also above ground biodiversity and, and how that can grow. And, grow and so on. And so um, how, how do you make the link from a product level or ingredient level um, claim to those system levels claim? What's the pathway there? Yeah, it's tricky. Um, part of it has to do with increasing the transparency and traceability of the materials you're using so that you know if I'm, if I'm using Moringa, okay, great, that's a biodiverse ingredient. But where does that moringa come from exactly? What are, the, what are the locations it's being grown? What different soil conditions? And if you can find out country of origin is a great start or even better to the farm level, then you have a whole bunch more tools that you can see what is the impact there? What is the economic climate, the cultural climate, the, the labor conditions in general in that particular country or in a uh, particular subregion or even set of farms where moringa is being produced? So that link between what is the ingredient and where is it grown is a really important one for the sort of for, first step towards systems level. There's also a, a more complete and complex approach that the life cycle assessment community has taken. Um, that just builds these very complex, basically webs of interaction and causality for any given ingredient in any given place. So much so that it's almost, it's hard to track them. It's hard to make sense of them. Uh, and so we like to play between both of those and sort of learning from the very detailed full life cycle assessment approach and the relatively straightforward, understandable, transparent, where does it come from? What are the impacts on the ground there? Does that answer your question, Arthur? Does that kind of get to it? I guess, yeah. Cool. Um, I think Lauren raised her hand there. So Lauren, go ahead. You have a question or thought on that? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I was curious when you described the example of systems level, I feel like that's a common area that um, organizations might make misleading or overstated claims about, oh, we're doing all this good. We planted, you know, a thousand trees last year. <laughs> um, but that, so they're, they're claiming reforestation, which of course does have benefit, but 
it might not actually be comparable to the amount of biodiversity loss that is occurring elsewhere. And mm -hmm. so it's almost an offset instead of an impact. And I'm wondering if you could just talk about that a little. Yeah, uh, that happens all the time. Um, it's not necessarily what we want, but I, I, I guess I would say I would prefer that a company makes a claim like that because at least it shows that they're starting to think about the system. And at least that has people go, oh, right, that touches, you know, that touches something somewhere. What is the impact of that? How does that work? And it starts people thinking in a more systemic way. And the more that people can do that, then we'll basically we'll get the greater scrutiny, the greater knowledge that emerges and is emerging, especially in uh, you know, millennials and Gen Z who want to know and see more of the story to be asking better and harder questions to say, yeah, that's great. You plant a thousand trees, but um, did you cut down 10,000 trees in order to have that field that you're now planting back? And we'll yeah, see if and there's going to, yeah, go ahead. Arthur. I mean, there, I think part of what we, when we're counting, um, we just don't weight them the same. Right. Um, and so the loss of forest, is completely different than beginning some sort of improved agroforestry farm system or or newly planted trees right that they, they just don't i think from a measurement perspective not from a not from a marketing perspective that's a different story but from a measurement perspective that they're, they're just not the same thing right the, the, the regrowing of forest just takes hundreds of years. There's no getting around it. And I mean, the easiest way to think about it, and this isn't quite how our math works, but it's, it's a useful way of framing it. And it's, it's kind of, it's similar directionally, um, is that if you, if you're, if you cut down forest, you lose all of that at once. If you want to regrow that forest, you basically have to, understand the amortized loss of that forest over the 200 years it takes to regrow it or it let's say it's rainforest and it takes 80 years to regrow it 80 years what whatever it is depending on the system there's only so much you can improve per year and that underlying measurement is much less than the impact of deforestation which happens all at once and the last thing i'll add to that and then i'm going to go uh, get mike's thoughts on it um, but the last thing i'll add is that there's a real difference between measuring practices uh, or sort of claims and measuring uh, outcomes. Um, and so uh, I think the better certifications and standards that are starting to come out are actually measuring outcomes. So like the Savory Land to Market certification is an example of this, um, where you are actually tracking, not just did you plant trees, but what was the outcome on the ground, in the carbon, in the biodiversity that emerged from that happening. And so this is a, a really important shift that's just like maybe starting to happen in the industry is a focus on uh, outcomes as opposed to just tracking practices. And starting um, to happen, I mean, the desire for it to happen is growing very quickly. The, the data actually allow for that to happen is just going to be slower because it just takes time. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to pass it over to Mike Lee, who knows a um, thing or two about biodiversity. Uh, Mike, thought, question. Yeah, I actually have a question. I want to get your uh, point of view on, like, so we're looking at this claim, like, new biodiverse ingredient, Moringa, right? And, you know, how do you kind of support that? word characterizing Moringa as biodiverse and at what point when let's say in our wildest dreams Moringa becomes as popular as oat milk does today is it biodiverse anymore? Like, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean so my, my pipe dream for this would be basically to have a total acres planted or a total tons per year which we have for a lot of plants, but is harder to get for something like Moringa. And basically as that increases and becomes on par with larger scale commercial ingredients, it's biodiversity weighting in our system would go down. We actually don't have that in our back end yet, but that's, what, that's the kind of sensitivity we're working towards because it's, when it's Moringa in, just, in, in, a, in a relatively standard cropping system, um, it's just, 
it's not that interesting, right? It is better to have a diversity of ingredients made, uh, available for commercial use. Like there's no knocking that, right? Having more than one variety of anim breed of animal or variety of tomato or, or, or species of, um, of large scale grown material creates a certain food security and crop security and a certain a resistance to a given set of pests or climactic conditions or whatever. But it, from the ecosystem perspective, you're generally using the same land in a relatively similar way with a relatively similar amount of pesticides or um, herbicides or whatever. So it's, it becomes less interesting. So in and of itself, it gets some waiting for just being a new crop and that's good although that's less than being say a new system or a system that better allows for biodiversity in the surroundings or biodiversity in the greater region um, but it gets some benefit for being a new crop and that benefit should and we don't have a mechanism for this because so few do it right now but i really there would be a, a data-driven mechanism where as that as that crop standard practice it would it would not increase the biodiversity score of a product anymore but for something like moringa honestly the, the the speed at which that acreage can actually change is so slow that that's 15 years away before it's a real before it's not having an impact you know and there's there's another angle that will um that will go to on this as i get a little further um which is arthur was sort of speaking to the on the ground, actual planted area and conditions there. But there's a sort of a, <clears throat> which is harder data to come by, but there's a relatively objective source of data that we can use as sort of a, a proxy for what's out there and being used in the food system that we'll talk about a little bit later on, though the same thing would happen as, uh, as Moringa becomes more and more common then its relative sort of biodiversity, uh, I don't know, hotness or coolness score or something would would decrease over time. I'm just going to speak briefly to one other question from Yam, uh, and then I'll move on in the presentation. Um, so Yam asked a question here, which is about, you know, when a product is carbon, quote unquote, carbon neutral, is it a system level measurement? Um, how are they, how are they measuring it? And is it really effective? Or is it greenwashing? Um, so it is systems level because nobody who does those sort of claims um, would, would not at least in some way account for the wider system. If you're going out there and saying we're carbon neutral, especially a carbon neutral certified, there is some pretty rigorous, usually life cycle assessment based assessments uh, that look at a whole system supply chain that takes transportation into account. It should take you know, fertilizers into account, which are often the greatest production of greenhouse gases, greenhouse gas emissions in any ingredients supply chain, most often is from fertilizers, um, other practices, tillage, et cetera, have impacts and actually infrastructure level of mechanization has impacts as well. Um, so usually if you see a carbon neutral claim that has some sort of third party verification, it's pretty good. They've done some work, they have looked at a systems level. Is it necessarily you know, as complete and as far reaching as, as we want it to be? No, probably not. Does it take into account biodiversity? No, definitely not. And this is, I think, one of the weaknesses of life cycle assessment, which I'll talk about in a bit, is that there's some kind of limited uh, ways to measure biodiversity in it. Arthur, anything you want to add? And then I'll go on to slides. Um, yeah, just, I think it's a really good question. And yeah, the, I think the main thing is if if you were to be to have an expert level of comfort with the analysis for a claim of carbon neutral the question is always would you agree on the system boundaries within the system boundaries the analysis is usually pretty good um surprisingly good but the question is would you agree that their system boundaries were fair wait what's were, the system boundary uh say so old lcas would often not even include on farm emissions for example for for old corporate lcas and that's expanded now and they're you they usually do right but so questions like that and understanding that of so boundary is basically like what you include and what you don't what inputs are part of it and what aren't and so you've heard terms like cradle to gate cradle to cradle cradle to grave those are all markers of system boundaries effectively 
And so cradle to cradle or cradle to grave, um, you're probably going to agree by and large with the system boundaries, but they're not all, those aren't always the system boundaries used and those aren't always publicized. I think that's the biggest area for disagreement. Usually the actual measurements inside aren't necessarily um, foolproof, uh, but there's really good arguments for them, even if you would disagree with them, right? But the system boundaries, oftentimes you can, especially early LCAs or early claims, you look at them and you go, hmm, you're missing some big stuff there. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So I'm going to move on and I think this will add somebody else asked a question that we will kind of make our way around back to. Um, so I will share screen again here. So we just looked at these three different levels of measurement from business as usual to the sort of pro individual product level to systems level measurements. And now what I want to do is I want to talk about what's kind of currently happening. What are some of the standard measurement approaches that are happening and what are the limitations of them? And then we'll look at some emerging measurements uh, and basically what we see the opportunity as uh, coming up. So standard measurements, you know, the first one, I think I have nine of them here that we'll look at, eight or nine to look at. Um, the first one is um, actually, there's a zero that I left off, but I'll, I'll put it back in here for this crowd. Zero is basically um, obfuscation or misleading uh, kind of claims or measurement that are saying things that lead you to believe, wow, this is a natural, this is a great product, or we're doing all this work, but it's actually still um, negatively affecting biodiversity somewhere, or purposely obfuscating is the worst. Uh, a little better than that, number one, is no real measurement or reference. And the limitation is there's not a lot of upside in this, and there's increasing downside risk as people understand more and more the threats to biodiversity and how various ingredients from corn to soy to palm to um, uh, even to quinoa can have some downside risk associated with them on a social or environmental level. And so, so business as usual, not reporting on, at least tracking for themselves, uh, biodiversity has a pretty serious and we think increasing downside risk. Some of the existing approaches right now at the product level is kind of like we, we talked about before. Now biodiverse with oats. Oats have been touted as this biodiverse ingredient because they are planted less commonly than corn and soy. Um, there's still a lot of oats being grown and they are, yeah, I guess a little more biodiverse and they do tend to have some beneficial impacts on soil microbiology a little bit, but it's, it's not huge. And so the sort of limitation with this is they're simplistic. It's just looking at one aspect of the system and it may be misleading. Yeah, biodiverse with oats in a gigantic monoculture, industrial tillage, chemical agriculture field where we've you know, destroyed biodiversity either recently from cutting down rainforest or several hundred years ago when we tilled up the prairie to plant here the first time. Um, so it's limited if you're just making single ingredient claims. On the systems level or sort of in between the two, there's, there's one where there's like a single factor impact. Um, and this was an interesting early one that emerged, which was bird friendly coffee where they were looking at, yeah, coffee can negatively impact through the pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, biocides that are being used, plus the clearing of forests, can negatively impact birds and bird life. And so to develop a standard or certification around bird-friendly coffee is, it's a step, right? It's, it's looking at a larger system, but it's only really focusing on one aspect. It's only looking at the birds. So it's like a step towards systems level without actually really fully doing systems level. The next level up, this fourth option, <clears throat> is where you're doing a single ingredient LCA or measurement. Uh, and so this is where you're looking at the oat field or, um, or the coffee field or you know, any particular ingredient that you're using and doing measurements in that area to say, all right, what is, the, <clears throat> what is the biodiversity of different bugs or of uh, different bird life or soil microbiology in this area uh, that we're growing this crop? And is that increasing? If I put pollinator strips, does that make it so there's more pollinators in this field? So that's, that's a sort of single ingredient measurement. A single ingredient LCA goes a bit further and it says, what are all the impacts with a pretty good large systems boundary that are happening because of the production of pollinators? oil because of the production of uh, monk fruit. Uh, and so that single ingredient 
was, that can be good. It can be interesting. You might find out, wow, you know, monk fruit um, supports a diverse uh, forest system in the area around where it's grown in China. But monk fruit's only 0.7% of the whole formulation of a product. And so by highlighting an LCA for a single ingredient, you might be missing out on the 30% of that product that is palm oil or palm oil derived ingredients. Um, and so this is some of the, the limitation, both what we already talked about that can be misleading, but then also sometimes it's hard to communicate. Like, uh, you know, insect pollinator life went up 10% in our field. Does the consumer even care? Like, so what? It's, it's harder to kind of get the tangible point across uh, to the market of what that means and, and what impact it's really ha having. Another step up is the full product life cycle assessment. Um, and here you're actually taking all the ingredients, the processing, the manufacturing, and looking at the full system and all the different impacts on carbon, on water, on energy use, even on biodiversity. In life cycle assessment, the primary sort of metric that's used um, for assessing biodiversity is it's basically, it's kind of a funny one. It usually ends up being a decimal number of like 0 0.014326 or something. And it's the number of species that you have helped contribute to them going extinct uh, is, the, is the kind of standard measurement in life cycle assessment, which is a little hard to understand even for an expert. It's like, how do, how do I image that? How do I really make that real? The other limitations for full product life cycle assessments is that they're expensive. You know, it can be anywhere from a hundred to $250,000 to do a single product life cycle assessment. Um, and that can take nine to 12 months. Um, so it's expensive, it's time consuming. And as I was saying, the metrics may be a bit intangible and, and hard to communicate. Okay, so that's come of some of currently what's out there. Are there any comments or little things you wanna to add to sort of that side? No, I don't think so. I think that was, uh, those last three um, got my, my, the content and the tone that I, <laughs> that I agree with. Okay, so here's some more on the emerging side. Here's what's, what's starting to come out, what we're seeing, what we're uh, inviting and even recommending that companies start exploring and working on. Um, this one, I'm gonna start at the systems level and sort of go down. This is portfolio level biodiversity impact based on supply system heuristics. So this is where I'm looking at all of the ingredients that I purchase to make the product that my, you know, the food product or the health and beauty product or whatever product that my company offers. Uh, I'm looking at everything that I purchase and I'm saying, where does that come from? And therefore, what are the likely risks, damages, and um, you know, possibilities that emerge from where my material is sourced from? So it's relatively efficient, it's resource efficient, because you, all you need to know is what you're buying, how much you're buying, where it comes from. There's a few other things you have to add in there, like uh, you have to know some stuff about yields um, and supply chain routes and import export data, but you can find out quite a bit just by understanding what do I buy, how much of it, and where does it come from? And then I can see where are the likely hotspots. Where is it that there's the greatest chance I am causing deforestation, that number one important you know, land use change for, for negatively impacting biodiversity. Um, you can also uh, figure out or sort of prioritize in a portfolio of 10 or 100 or 1,000 ingredients, which ones should I look at and engage with in order to do more detailed study, in order to you know, go down to the product level perhaps, or in order to do a single ingredient or a full product LCA, you sort of figure out where should we focus our attention in order to understand the actual biodiversity impact of our portfolio. The other thing is, is that if you use some heuristic rules or if you have um, you know, some sort of software or tool to, to do this and, and make it fast for you, it can really quickly like, highlight and help communicate throughout your organization and even potentially externally, where do we need to put our attention focus for further measurement and study? And that communication can be really important, especially when compared to some of the hard to communicate side stuff uh, over on this side. Um, I saw a bunch of questions pop up. Should we do questions now or should I go through the, the next ones? Uh, let's do some questions on this one. What, um, Arthur, are you watching those and can you kind of yeah. respond to any of them? Yeah, um, well, um, uh, JR's question we're gonna leave because we're coming to that, right? 
Yep. Is that right? Okay. Yep. So um, for the, I mean, the, yeah, um, your question, we, we just did that um, at How Good over the past year. Um, we're really proud of it. We actually launch it in a few days um, with our first uh, client test base testers. Um, and yeah, it's, 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 it's obviously for one client, not for the whole system, but we have linked every crop and ingredient, every ingredient um, to its um, transport and um, crop and location-based biodiversity impacts. And it allows them to see that product by product and to make decisions based on, based on prioritizing, not just on the impact, but on the, the, the impact by the number of pounds, right? If you buy one kilo of palm oil and 400,000 kilos of wheat, the wheat has a bigger Im biodiversity impact than the palm oil, even though in our little color grading system, wheat would be an orange and palm oil would be a red, right? And so it allows people to do that. And uh, anyway, that's where we've been working there, not just for biodiversity, but for a few different metrics for the past year. And it's been an amazing project and uh, really excited about it. Yeah, and I think it's really um, that sort of modeling is good based on the vast amount of data we've been able to gather, but it gets even better when we're partnering with organizations to understand their specific supply systems. So, you know, uh, I just talked with another company today who works with a number of farmers. They have long-term relationships in buying from them in order to source their really, make their high quality products. And they want to do some, they want to be able to talk a bit more about the biodiversity, uh, but they didn't know exactly how to, what questions to ask, what to look for. Suppliers are, you know, as farmers especially are incredibly busy. And so we have a pretty quick system set up now where we can upload data either from other software platforms that are out there that are tracking information at farm level or just have a 20 minute conversation with a farmer or a supplier and get some of the key bits of information to enhance the granularity of the database so instead of saying this is coming from um, you know the island of Borneo uh, and this particular part close to Brunei uh, and have a general idea of what's happening and what the likelihood of deforestation there is, we can find out and talk to the exact supplier, learn what they're doing and get to a greater level of, you know, farm level. Even we could take a polygon that shows where the farm is, check it with satellite data and have a huge amount more information about that specific supplier, that specific farm. And so what we built is a heuristic model that can see the whole system any of 30,000 ingredients you type in you would get an initial like here's some good information about it and then we can further specify it hone it in and add detail uh, to a really robust structure that we're starting with so that's the sort of that's what we're thinking for systems level measurement is doing this portfolio level impact based on supply system heuristics getting down to the product level though i think there's some cool stuff we can do um, so uh, there's this other thing that's being developed that is an all ingredient index against the product universe. And so the product universe here, let's just say it's a million uh, products, a million SKUs, a million UPCs of you know, consumer packaged goods that are, uh, that are out there uh, in the, on the planet right now. What we can do is we can take the ingredient lists for every single one of those products pull them together, match them against the how good database that basically reveals what is the origin, um, the sort of source material for any given um, ingredient. So I've been doing some work in health and beauty. We were just looking at um, an isopropyl palmitate, uh, which is an interesting chemical, useful for a bunch of different things. But if you know what the likely and almost definitely source materials are that created, you'd say, oh, that's actually most likely from palm and coconut oil, therefore it's likely from these places. So you can, you can understand what is the source crop for any given ingredient if you have that, and you have this whole list of a million products and all the ingredients for each of them, then you can run some pretty objective quantitative numbers on what are the most common and least common crops. It's not even most and least, it's a gradient of crops that are being used, and that could be animal or plant or mineral even, that are being used in the food system. When you run that analysis, of course, the top three ingredients that always come out are like water, salt, 
sugar. Arthur knows them better than I do, but there's like a handful. And then there's crops like corn and soy that are really, really high up in terms of sort of frequency or commonality. But then when you get down to the middle, like is apple more commonly used than apricot? Mm, hard to tell, but we can quantitatively get that data. So here's a little just example that I pulled from some of this research. I took 100,000 products from the US market and saw that 72,000 of them, 72,217 had corn in them. 43,909 of them had palm in it. Apples were only in about 8,000 of them. Oats were only in 3,000, and Moringa was only in 20. So this is kind of going back to uh, our discussion early on with Mike about a different approach. Instead of saying, how much Moringa is planted in the world? You say, how many products is Moringa actually in? And then based on this, you can create a sort of a weighted score. So then you look at a, an individual you know, product that's made up of however many ingredients. If you know the percent, is it 10% uh, Moringa and 20% corn and 30% water? You know, what are the actual ingredients? And then you can weight them against the score that you get out of this and have a objective uh, quantitative score for any given product um, that shows how biodiverse is it. The last one that I'll add on here is that when you can do that, then you can benchmark any given product against an industry or against a set of categories, or you can take your whole portfolio of the hundred SKUs or a thousand SKUs and say, how biodiverse is our portfolio compared to the rest of the industry? Okay. I'm going to pause there and see, Arthur, if you have any thoughts, questions you want to add to this side and or shall we take some more questions from everyone who's on? So, yeah, I mean, I just, the, the margin question is really interesting. We're not at a point where we're tracking margin yet, but um, I, that's definitely a thing that people are starting to ask us for and something that we're thinking about building. Um, I think it's less exciting because, um, it's not as difficult research, but we do see the value in providing it. And so Ethan and I have been uh, plotting back on and forth on when that becomes, a, when that sort of data becomes a priority, the same for sales performance. Um, so when the newness of an ingredient is driving sales, we have that data and to link that through for people is an interesting thing. And we've been playing with that as well, but the, that's data that other people have that we can link because of the way our system works, but it's not as much fun and doesn't feel as important as understanding the on the ground biodiversity impact of a given crop or a given ingredient mix in a given product or batch of products or portfolio or brand, et cetera. Um, so yes, but not quite yet is I guess the answer there. And Lauren, yeah, I think seven does that is that that's the way to help identify alternatives, right? It's like you start is is in to identify compare alternatives in comparison to each other becomes um, much, much more impactful pragmatically than um, than just doing them in isolation. Right. And um, another kind of bit on that that is a bit of a tangent i'll just kind of point towards and maybe we won't go on today but would love to would love to go on a bit in the future and maybe mike and others here can can help us think about a little panel here of who we would want to sort of talk about this but there's this problem that we've sort of labeled as the the quinoa problem where when an ingredient starts to get hot or exciting there's this sudden rush for it and it may have you know negative consequences on the farmers who are originally growing it. It may cause the center of production to shift and be, uh, go into a different place in a different form of production that actually is not very biodiverse or helpful to the ecosystem. And so, especially when we work with some really big companies, if they all of a sudden find one of those alternatives down there and go to buy it all, does that have you know, negative unintended consequences? And how do you structure a system? How do you structure relationships from small companies or large companies uh, so that they're actually in reciprocity with the ecosystems and the, the cultures where some of these less common, you know, biodiverse crops are being grown. One kind of interesting example that I've been following as a customer and as a friend is the Ethan Frisch over at Burlap and Barrel, who's doing these amazing single origin spices from all over the world. I just ordered some yesterday called Iru that's a fermented um, locust bean from West Africa 
that tastes like a mixture between, I think he said chocolate and cheese or something like that. Really just wild, crazy flavors. And he's figured out a way to be in relationship with single origin um, producers uh, in a way that I think is supporting biodiversity, but he's also not ordering such a huge amount that it's having negative unintended consequences. Um, so I, I think this is a really interesting thing to watch out for. If we were to publish a list, I mean, there's already lists out there of the most uncommon crops, so you can, you can get those, but- Yeah, I, mean, um, I feel like we're getting hung up on them in this conversation. Like Philip's asking a question about that. And, and I think like there is a temptation to these new crops and we have, we have that same tension within how good of like, it's good to encourage new crops but that's different than the on the ground biodiversity. And I think that the slide before that Ethan was showing, like that's where the conversation ended because he was coming back around to the product level stuff and the ingredient level stuff. But as a measure of the impact on biodiversity rather than the crop biodiversity, those are still very much two very different things for us. And, and we think are both very important, right? The, the, the the different crops and the different ingredients um, are incredibly important for um, the resilience of our food system and the different cropping systems and the on the ground biodiversity and the the ecological biodiversity surrounding a farm in a region overall and so on can be affected by so many different things and we put a lot of our effort at how good into measuring what those impacts are so not so much is this just a different crop but what is the impact of growing this crop in this way and you know whereas growing something organic may not guarantee any difference in how scales for a given crop it often does impact biodiversity in the surrounding ecosystem in some really interesting ways not guaranteed either but for certain crops it's a very positive impact right and so and we are very focused on that. And, and, and I think if it's coming around, and so it, from recency bias, it seems like we're over-focused on the different ingredients. I would say that we're not. We're, we're, we definitely see them as both incredibly important to track and to encourage. Um, and uh, part of our partnership with Bioversity International to that question has really helped gain some detailed geospatial information about uh, biodiversity on an individual farm at a you know 30 meter by 30 meter resolution sometimes we have data about soil microbiology we know things like what is the percent of tree cover in agricultural fields of certain crops depending on the crop depending on the country we know you know what percent has animal integration in it so we can actually get from these large databases quite good information again not just about the crop itself but about the ecosystem context. When you then cross that with some of the larger maps on like global biodiversity hotspots or you know, Global Forest Watch is a great free resource you can check out to just see where forest, you know, forest change is happening currently. Then we're able to hit all of those. And you know, admittedly, we're hitting some of them with less depth than we'd like, but by holding them all at the same time, we're able to see change and we're able to mark change, positive or negative, for a given ingredient or growing situation. Let's see who else has got uh, thoughts here. So Mike was asking, you know, have you, have you looked to correlate biodiversity level uh, of an ingredient, or I would say by extension of a product, to better flavor, nutrition, et cetera? Um, no, that would be so much fun. Uh, we should totally do that. I no, disagree. disagree. I no, I think it'd be awesome. I think it'd be really interesting to look at a a product level. We don't do this work. How good? Probably we'll never do this work. We're never going to work on flavor, um, <laughs> unless but, you fire your director of research. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I think it would be really interesting if we had those sort of biodiversity scores per ingredient or product then we just need to you know match them up with somebody else's database on you know flavor or consumer insights or what was that thing mike you knew those folks that put the 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 like matrix thing on your head and and actually read what's going on it's like a functional mri as you're eating different things and read stuff about it like it'd be very interesting to have that sort of stuff right side by side on the flavor <laughs> side. i think on the nutrition we actually do have a little bit of data and information. So we do know um, 
for example, there's a database through, um, through one of our partners that has nutritional information on underutilized crops. And those by and large are much higher nutrition than you know, the top 12 crops that are dominating uh, you know, what we eat in the world. And so there is, you know, it's not exact links, but there's definitely a sort of um, uh, heuristic proxying that can be done for less common will likely lead to higher nutrition. Uh, we haven't done that in a verified third-party way. Arthur doesn't like that one either. Um, but uh, it's just, yes, I, I, I have say. one of one of I feel like my specialties over the past ten years has been figuring out things that can be gamed and avoiding them, and 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 flavor, flavor and nutrition end up linking to linking linking flavor and nutrition heuristically is very easy to be gamed. Um, that's what that's what my resistance would be. I love the idea of being able to do it. I just I just actually think it's a lot more complex than it sounds and actually impossible from from a data perspective, right? Like it could because you can't example. Give us an example. An example would be a granola bar made with quinoa. Let's say quinoa was good for a second. Okay, let's just pretend that's great and oats are bad just for a moment. Um, and just because it's made with quinoa doesn't mean the people who designed the product did a good job, that the other ingredients that balance the mouthfeel and the amount of sugar and so on are well put together. It's like that early stage organic in the 90s where like things were selling just because they were organic, even though they were like palpably made of cardboard and like organic cardboard was somehow still like good. Um, that... It, it doesn't work like it's like it's it's there's this there's it it's almost a good thing to judge something on its biodiversity and judge something on its environmental impact as a separate indicator that weighs against how it tastes and hopefully can line up and when you have both you have a triumphantly beautiful amazing product right and when you have one you have a product with weaknesses it's either appealing to people's sense of goodness or their sense of taste, and that's not good enough. You want something, you want to evaluate those separately and to find the products that are great at both independent, to me. Fascinating. Well, we'll continue arguing about this here in the office as soon as we're off in a couple minutes. Um, let's see, there's a question from Mark here uh, about consumer demand. Assuming that consumer demand drives food retailers brands. Stop. I don't actually think that's the case necessarily anymore. Um, we're seeing for the first time, we're really seeing uh, brands actually leading. Brands and manufacturers are like getting ahead of and understanding and looking at biodiversity, regenerative agriculture in a deeper way than some consumers understand them. And I think starting to, starting to move markets because of what they think is a good idea and where they want to go. Um, so I don't necessarily make that assumption that consumer demand drives brands, I guess not leading brands. Many others will follow and they often say, wait, you know, what do the consumer, do consumers care about regenerative agriculture? Do consumers care about biodiversity? Oh, they do? Okay, then I'm interested, you know, how will I approach that? Um, but I have not seen to the question, you know, successful education campaigns around biodiversity. Uh, wow. <laughs> That's a big one. Yeah, it's a big loss. Um, uh, I have not, I haven't seen it being pushed yet. I think we're going to see it in the not so distant future. Um, but so far, I have not seen a sort of uh, pushing or driving of biodiversity. It's been from leading organizations and NGOs, you know, Food Tank, Food Tech Connect, others have been kind of pushing and, and helping us see and start thinking about biodiversity. But from a brand side, I haven't really seen a lot sort of leading it yet. Um, what is driving the leading brands on biodiversity? I think they care. I think they're yeah. actually, yeah, go ahead. I think a generational change um, and people who are getting involved in food have been getting involved in food for 20 years, had a different, have had a different, you know, there, how, how many people are leading teams who, who grew up actually, I don't know, picking up trash on the side of the road for Earth Day? Like, I, I mean, I'm kind of kidding, but serious. Like, the, the people we work with in even the really big brands, genuinely care and 10 years ago they didn't i mean and not just like leadership really and not everyone and i'm not pretending that every ceo is suddenly a good ceo and whatever that's not like it's not this isn't a naive thing this is this continuing 
this continuing pleasant surprise where there is where there, where there are well informed people that care a lot trying to often just work with minimizing the harm of their decisions not to create something new and good um, because that's what they feel like are the limitations of their roles at a given time, but open to that and starting to engage on it and pushing into it and finding money in amazing places to actually generate it. I mean, biodiversity measurement work we were just describing has been paid for by brands that I think 10 years ago, I couldn't have imagined participating this wholeheartedly. It's been, I mean, it's cool. It's, yeah, I think there is real change happening inside these companies from people who don't want to be associated with a company that's not doing good. And I think on just to that point, there is some interesting sales data we're starting to see and sort of parse through around biodiverse products selling better in the marketplace. And I think that will, um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see what happens in the coming years. I think, you know, forget the sort of consumer sentiment consumer spending patterns and buying, if there's a real uptick there in biodiverse products, we'll see a bunch of brands um, coming to watch this video that we've just recorded and we'll post for you all afterwards. So here is the upcoming events we have in this series. Uh, Danone, uh, Tina Owens is gonna give a talk on regenerative dairy. That's gonna be fascinating. Yolele uh, Pirtiam, who I mentioned today, uh, for Moringa and Fonio is going to give a talk on crop commercialization, sort of Q&A. We'll have Wesley Wilson from the World Economic Forum sharing their perspective on planetary health and regenerative agriculture. And then if you have never seen Eric Tonsmeyer give a talk, um, you got to come to this one. We're going to be looking at agroforestry and industrial crops. So not food this time, but for like bioplastics and rubbers and fiber and all this stuff. He's a world leading expert on, on carbon farming, regenerative agriculture. Um, it's going to be amazing. That system. That's going to be great. All these are going to be great. Hope to see you there. Thanks everyone for coming.